Hello, my name is Reina Ayala, and I just first want to start off by saying thank you for having me, and thank you for listening to my talk. There were nails in my shoes. Nails in my shoes so that each step stomped away doubt that, indeed, the marshmallows in my hands were actually turtle eggs. It's true that the flurried, colorful movements of Mexican folk dresses are sirens to even the most unsuspecting audience member. These dresses are loud. And louder was the fact that I, a kindergarten-aged half-Mexican girl with a pint of gel in her hair, was performing a dance of rich symbolism. My shoes stepped with their own rhythm, not always on beat, but we can pretend that this was in the spirit of anti-establishmentism. From this very sentiment, black Mexicans developed the turtle dance satirizing their dehumanized status and representing the indigenous woman with a turtle dress dancer. Circling dancers collected her eggs, in reality marshmallows, and threw them to the audience upon the song's final chord. I grew up on the premise of the turtle dance, that of magical realism, a personified, larger-than-life understanding of one's surroundings. Magical realism is not fantasy. Rather, it is an alternative take on reality. Magical realism as a literary strategy originated in Latin American fiction. So magical realism originated in Latin America, but it spread to a worldwide movement. And yet, it's still hard to understand what magical realism really is. It's best understood by experiencing its effect. So I have selected a quick little excerpt from one of my favorite short stories written by Gabriel Garcia Marquez called A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings. And it's just the first few lines of the short story. On the third day of rain, they had killed so many crabs inside the house that Pelayo had to cross his drenched courtyard and throw them into the sea, because the newborn child had a temperature all night and they thought it was due to the stench. The world had been sad since Tuesday. Sea and sky were a single ash-gray thing, and the sands of the beach, which on March nights was so weak at noon that when Pelayo was coming back to the house after throwing away the crabs, it was hard for him to see what it was, that was moving and groaning in the rear of the courtyard. He had to go very close to see that it was an old man, a very old man, lying face down in the mud, who, in spite of his tremendous efforts, couldn't get up, impeded by his enormous wings. To categorize this story as fantasy, would be severely misconceived. In each tarnished feather of the old man's wings, magical realism is infused. Magical realism is a vessel to understand the nuances of the natural world. And in this world, magic is extraordinarily ordinary. So just take a moment and let that sink in because it's a lot to process, especially if you haven't heard the term magical realism before. But you may be surprised to know that I do not plan on studying literature in college. <laughs> this is a picture of the robot from my robotics team. So I'm pretty set on studying engineering in the next four years. And you may be further surprised to know that I have always identified as a girl wishing to pursue STEM. STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But of course, in parallel, I developed an affinity for literature because I see them to be one and the same. They use similar thought processes. In your typical STEM classroom, they teach you the following steps for inquiry execution and analysis. To ask a question, investigate the concepts, 
That is, conduct your background research. Make sure you're not starting from zero and you're able to take into account the work of your predecessors. And from that, you can form your hypothesis. You design and conduct the experiment and you process your results, often creating graphs and charts. And then you get to draw a conclusion, remembering to acknowledge your error. So my point in bringing this up is that these steps are actually universal. They can be applied to all areas of education. And as a current high school student who's in an English class, one of the greatest challenges that I've noticed my peers struggle with is acknowledging error within literary analysis. Because how could you possibly know whether you're correct? And this is exactly the fallacy that I wish to disprove. Our education system is hyper-focused on results. We're always striving for the correct answer without asking ourselves whether there exists only one correct answer. In literature, there are multiplicities of correct answers. As a student, you are unbounded. And I want to convince you that the same concept can be applied to STEM. Just as we have used science inquiry steps to explain literary analysis, to draw parallels between the two thought processes, now I want to use a literary strategy, magical realism, to explain STEM. We love to equate science with fact. And I am a strong believer that Science is probably the closest to fact that we will ever achieve. But they're not the same, and that matters. All of science is this living, breathing monster of a model. It is constantly evolving, and its heart beats with the, to the rhythm of ongoing studies. It's best explained with magical realism. The summer after my eighth grade year, I found myself standing before Mount St. Helens, surrounded by exposed layers of pumice and ash. And in each fallen rock, in each crevice of the landscape that was forcefully morphed by pyroclastic flow, there is a story just waiting to be told. Each rock gives us a clue to the story behind it. It, the job of scientists is to translate the dialogue of our natural surroundings and turn it into something meaningful to you and I. Scientists and engineers are merely the world's newest scribes. And this is magical realism. It doesn't just belong to authors, but it entrenches the work of scientists and engineers. The sciences are the tools that we use to unlock the stories of our surroundings, spoken in the tongue of mathematics. And then engineers, they take those stories and they use them to improve human society. And that is my favorite explanation for STEM, because it takes from the subjectivity of literary analysis and applies it to STEM. Scientists are not immune to error. In the realm of magical realism, this just means that certain pieces of that narrative get lost in translation. And when we make scientific discoveries, it means that we get to unveil those lost pieces. Science is not limited by one correct answer. And no, I'm not refuting the fact that when you have an equation and you plug in values, you're gonna get a result. That's pretty logical. But rather, looking at science and thinking about it as the bigger picture of science, that monster of a model, which will never be perfect. We have to keep an open mind so that we don't miss certain pieces that come back to us that were once lost. And my favorite example of this is the contradiction between two incredibly well-developed branches of modern physics. 
So our first theory was developed by a guy that not that many people have heard of, Albert Einstein. He reimagined gravity as the distortion of space-time. And yes, you heard me right. That's space-time, not two different things, but together. The fates of space and time are beautifully intertwined into space-time. And when masses are introduced to this blanket of space-time, they warp it. And that effect is called gravity. This is general relativity. It does a good job at describing the dynamics of space at the massive scale. We're talking galactic collisions, we're talking universe expansion. And then our second big theory is quantum mechanics. It reigns over the smallest of scales. Its foundation is in superposition, where multiple states exist at once. To best explain this theory, I'm going to use the thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat, which has been simplified for our purposes here. Let's imagine that we have a cat in a box. The box is not closed yet. And we also have a container that has poison inside of it. So at this point in the presentation, I'm just going to be grateful that I do not have any hands-on demonstrations today because we are putting the cat in the box next to the poison, in the container. And we know that there is a 50% chance that the poison will escape, it will become aerosolized and thus kill the cat. And we're going to close that box. Once we do, we have no way of knowing whether that cat is dead or alive. And quantum mechanics says, that's easy. It's both. Because until the cat has been observed, it exists in both states. Observation forces the direction of nature. Quantum mechanics becomes relevant when we're studying subatomic particles. And this is our model of an atom. We have the nucleus made up of neutrons and protons. We have electrons orbiting the nucleus. But this is a simplified model. This is not how atoms behave. Think of it as your favorite piece of folklore. It does, yeah, a decent job at communicating some key themes that you could take into your everyday life and you would do just fine. But overall, it is a dramatic oversimplification of how the world actually works. And this is our more accurate model because it allows us to visualize electron fields. Think of each electron as akin to the cat. You can't know its specific energy or location until it has been observed. Therefore, it exists in multiple states at once. It exists as these electron fields. So we arrive at our two distinct narratives. Scientists have collected the dialogue of subatomic particles, and they organized it into a nice little story that they titled Quantum Mechanics. And separately, they collected the dialogue from planets, stars, galaxies on the cosmic scale, and organized that into its own story, general relativity. But these two narratives, they disagree. General relativity does not work on the subatomic level. And quantum mechanics, it doesn't align with observations on the cosmic level. That's primarily because general relativity is founded upon causality, where every cause matches with a specific effect. And that's clearly not the case with quantum mechanics. In fact, as we speak, Scientists are trying to prove general relativity as a subset of quantum mechanics, and we're just going to have to wait and see what they figure out with that. But in the meantime, let us marvel in the beauty that scientists came up with these two conflicting narratives. Using clues from our, from our natural surroundings, 
scientists developed two parallel stories. And that's because the clues came from different places at different scales. These stories are not static. They are born of generations of scientists, each imposing their own interpretation upon the information that they received, that came from their predecessors. They are each revising the narrative and just attempting to correct errors in translation. And in this way, science and literature are beautifully alike. The conclusions are limited by the scope of human-imposed interpretations. Under magical realism, our scientific model is given room to breathe. By applying literary concepts to STEM, we can finally acknowledge that scientific studies are influenced by our own interpretation. That is, we can only conclude what we can comprehend. And that's okay. We just need to acknowledge it, especially in the classroom. Because this is not just supplementary information. This gets to the very core of what we're doing. That awareness that the model can contradict itself, that's an unspoken secret among STEM professionals. But it's equally important for everyone to understand as well, because it reduces the intimidation factors surrounding STEM. It reveals to us that there do exist multiplicities within STEM. There's not just one correct answer. And it can help explain to a student sitting in a classroom why something makes sense. Oftentimes, we're given a formula and we're told this works because we've seen that it works from observations. And that's not very settling when you are a student. If you instead approach it from the angle of, yeah, you know what, we may not fully understand why this works, because the backstory has yet to be uncovered, then suddenly things just seem less intimidating. And that is precisely the importance of interdisciplinary education. It's just one of many, many examples of intertwining STEM with what's seen as the opposite and the benefits that you can receive from doing so. It forces us to question our own thinking to understand concepts with elevated levels of nuance. And now, we can venture into this world filled with more color and finally take on our role as storytellers. Thank you.